last year we had Travis Kalanick here um, of Uber, and to me this uh, is, a, uh, Brian Chesky's company is a similar version of, um, of the, the struggles, except I call him the nice Travis, but um, in any case, uh, Brian Chesky. You know, in that regard, I, I meant Travis, the cartoon character. <laughs> of course. Um, so, um, your company does face similar challenges to Uber. Yeah. Um, w can you talk about the, the similarities between sort of what you're struggling against, especially in the regulatory realm? Well, I think that we're, you know, we're both struggling with the fact that our business is probably growing a bit faster in regulation. And the 20th century was basically governed by this idea that there were people and there were businesses. And there were laws for people and there were laws for businesses. And then what happened was, over time, within 60 seconds, a person could become a micro-business. And then a city had to make a decision. What box does somebody check? You know, are they a person or a business? Well, we really think fundamentally that there needs to be a third category. And that third category would be a person as a business. And an example would be, like, in the city of San Francisco, there was a new law passed mm -hmm. that recognized home sharing. All they had to do was go to register our host. Well, if you actually look at the process to register, it actually, if it was that hard to start Airbnb, I don't think I would have actually started it. It was like a 50-step process. And so I think that we need to make sure that we take our time, understand that government is a place of last recourse. We should be partnering with government. But I totally understand why we have these challenges. You know, a version of us is that, you know, we are like the internet moving into your neighborhood. And I understand that why people have you know, concerns about that. Right. But I also think the other thing that's happening is we are creating economic opportunity for thousands and thousands of people. And this is when it's really actually hard to find economic well, opportunity. That's your happy argument, that you are getting people, they're going to get to do their own business, rent their house, which is a really happy yeah. scenario. Um, at the same time, you know, Peter Kaffa was pointing out someone was there being, being in, his, in his area, his building. Um, nothing happened, but it could have. And this was not something he had control over. So there are more complex issues for these cities to consider when everyone's becoming a business, where businesses are where homes used to be. Um, yeah. What's the responsibility of you all? I mean, you, uh, you, you know you had all those controversies which right. just died down. I don't think I've seen uh, right. you know, Airbnb orgy in years. <laughs> um, but it's, not that we know of. Not that you know of. <laughs> uh, not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> um, but I haven't seen that um, as much. Right. Um, that said, it's still, you know, if you were uh, someone in a rental apartment, you do have these issues. Where is that? Where, what have you done to fix that? Because it really hasn't popped up as much as it used to. Well, just to put things in perspective, we are in 34,000 cities. And the vast majority of those, all but just a few cities, we don't really have any significant issues, and we haven't had issues. In the cities where we have had issues, we have a very simple principle. You know, we want to enrich the cities we serve. I don't want to be in a city and not be wanted in that city. And so I think it's really, really important that we listen to cities, cities listen to us, and we're, we have things like now, like uh, neighbor and landlord hotlines. Um, we remove thousands of properties in New York and cities around the world if people aren't really honoring our values. And, you know, one of the consequences of growing so fast is, you know, when we started, I really believed in this, I, the kind of the Craig Newmark school that an online community was a bit like an immune system. And that if you build the right reputation system, that the reputation system would basically take care of itself. Over time, I've learned that maybe you need to go a little bit farther. And so we've gone a bit farther in really helping partner with cities. And one of the things we've done in, in the last year, since the last year, we've had nine different cities pass laws that now recognize home sharing. For example, the today, as of today, the, um, it's now recognized that you can share your home throughout the entire United Kingdom. The Queen of England signed this into law eight weeks ago. And the landmark regulation was probably beginning of last year, France. Legalized it in the entire country of France. And so you have a, a situation where I think city by city, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of how and when. And I think it's really a dialogue that we need to have city by city. But I, don't, I think the key thing is where it's not like a catch-all. The, the, do you think cities are really concerned with safety of people? Safety is important. Yeah. Uh, insurance. Yeah. Um, ability of owners not to right. see their rental properties being rented out. Right. Which one of those things is valid from your point of view? Well, all these are valid concerns. I think the big issue with cities we found is that I think people are afraid of what they don't understand. And when we've gone to cities, I've asked them to describe to me the service. Mm -hmm. And what they describe to me is something that really isn't our business. And, um, and what do so, they describe to you? 
They've described a site where um, people have a revolving door of tourists going into their neighborhoods, people renting homes 365 days a year, and I say, that is not our business. Our business is ordinary people renting their homes. Nine out of 10 people rent the homes they live in. Now, I can't completely generalize every single city, but that is vastly where a company comes from. And it started because I couldn't, I actually was living in San Francisco. Yeah, we know. Yeah, you know, so yeah, and I couldn't afford to pay rent. And that is a story that we hear all the time. 52% of our hosts, they say that they depend on Airbnb to stay in their homes. So that is the real data. Yeah, well, that's the that's a good you know that's the happy again the happy story you tell right. people. But what is there? What do you think the most difficult concern you're facing is? Is it the insurance? Is it that people aren't renting? What is the one that worries you? I think the thing that is concerning to me is we're in 34,000 cities, and every city seems to have different requirements or different expectations of us. So, and how so you literally have to go city by city. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, a lot of cities they don't want to be treated like everyone else. They say, no, we are different. Mm -hmm. We have unique issues. Mm -hmm. And the key solution here is to go to a city, talk to them about who you are, who they are. That is a huge time commitment. Mm -hmm. And you know, in Europe, these sometimes are uh, passed at the national level. So there was a national law in Portugal, a national law in UK, a national law in France. The United States, they're not even state laws, usually city laws, mm -hmm. and sometimes they're neighborhood considerations. How many people do you have working in your organization so we have legal, close that is that are <laughs> lobbyists or legal? Oh, in legal, um, I don't know the number of that. It's not a huge team, though. So it, we work pretty hard. But it's at the core of your business to get these cities to cooperate with Well, you. I think the core part of our business isn't through lobbyists, it's through the community. We have, you know, a community is incredibly active, and we have a pretty big community team. Because we found when we talk to regulators, what they really want to hear from, beyond hearing from me, is the community. They want to hear from their own voters. And so, for example, City of New York, we go to City of New York, and we say, we, did, we decided to do economic impact studies. We decided to hire the firm that the city hall, the mayor's office used. So we're like, you know, we did a study, but they actually commissioned it. And they found that we brought $1.15 billion to the city of New York, and that there are t uh, over 30,000 homes, and more than half of those hosts depend on Airbnb pay to rent a mortgage. And then we've actually connected our hosts to the cities. One of the big things that concerns is hotel taxes. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is a concern we're trying to solve. It turns out that, like, you can't send a briefcase of money to a city. I mean, people are like, why aren't you just like, doing no, this No, you faster? can give it to a politician. Yes, exactly. <laughs> just, yes, and that would create new problems. But you can't actually do it and get like, credit for it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, it's kind of crazy. We had a host. This is actually a crazy story. We had, like, in the city of New York, to be able to collect remit taxes, they have to change a law in Albany to do that. We had dozens of hosts in New York City take a bus, take days off of work, to go to Albany, New York, to convince the city to allow us to collect and remit taxes, which we supported. I mean, people thought I was insane, a CEO that wants to pay more taxes. Mm -hmm. But we're happy to do it, because we think to be regulated is to be recognized. And we actually want to be able to participate. So what is the most difficult city for you in this country? Probably New York. You know, I, um, if, when I started Airbnb, I'm from Albany, New York, upstate New York. Mm -hmm. And when I started Airbnb, if you were to tell me that um, you know, we're going to be in 191 countries, I would have thought, wow, we're going to have some real big challenges around the world. Mm -hmm. I would not have guessed that the city really close to where I grew up in would be probably the hardest challenge in the city. That was a huge surprise for me. Mm -hmm. And where I, are you now? I'm sorry? Where are you now with them? Um, I think at this point we've graduated from will Airbnb exist in New York. Now I think even our opponents say Airbnb is here to stay. So the question is, well, how will we exist? We would like to collect remit taxes. We'd like to allow people to share their ordinary homes they live in. And I think it's a matter of working with City Hall. We've been in discussions. I think like in tech, things happen in weeks and months. In sometimes city politics, they happen in years. Uh, two years ago, I said we were months away. I, I still think we're months away, but like, I think I should maybe not say that anymore. Maybe we're not months away. Okay. Um, I do think it's going to happen in the next couple of years, though. So are you <laughs> <laughs> Which is months in right. you know, our world. So, so you've, um, do you? Do you think you're like Uber in that regard? How do you look at Uber and their fight, uh, regulatory fights? Is that similar? I think everyone has to solve their own path. You know, mm -hmm. in the early days, you know, I remember when the, uh, this situation happened in New York, we had a decision. How are we going to deal with this? Mm -hmm. Are we going to go in and like, you know, stage huge rallies? And I, we thought back to our mission. You know, our mission is, well, can I, maybe I can just tell a quick story that illustrates our mission. And then I'll, and we'll tell right, you quick. how we deal with this. So yeah, quick. So, I was in London, um, not to, uh, and I met a host named Sebastian. He comes up to me, and he says, Brian, there's a word you never use in your website. I said, what's that word? He said, that word is friendship. I'd love to tell you a story about friendship. He said, six months ago, the London riots broke out outside my home, and I was very scared. 
The next day, my mom called me to make sure I was okay. He said, here's the crazy thing. Between the time the riots broke out and the time my mom called me was a 24-hour period of time. And in that period of time, seven of my previous Airbnb guests called me just to make sure I was okay. Another yeah, happy story. Exactly. I get that. I know. It's well, the point is that we are in the business of caring for people and bringing people together. A company like that can't be fighting. You don't want to have a business or a CEO that's a fighter mm -hmm. or completely fighting with cities when people every night are living together. A woman in Texas is staying with a guy in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. You want to have a company that is partnering with cities. And so we made a decision to actually partner with cities. This is probably four years ago. Mm -hmm. We're in conversations about 40 different cities around the world, and this is how we've done it. So you thought being obstreperous was not, you know. Being what? Difficult. Sorry, yeah. it's, a, it's a word. I'll, obstreperous. It means you're yeah, a pain yeah, in the ass, yeah. um, uh, essentially. Um, I think people still think we're a pain in the ass because right. of how fast it's grown. And just to give you an example, um, tonight around the world we'll have half a million people mm -hmm. staying in a home and this summer that number will be 800,000 people staying in a home. So it's grown so fast that people just find us to be sometimes difficult. So these but are we're new trying statistics? To that this yeah, is... yeah, the 800,000 I've never shared before, but it just gives you a sense that we're close to a million people a night staying in a home. I mean, just tonight around the world more people are staying in Airbnbs than live in the city of Miami. Okay. Um, so the... Um... I, I was trying to think what that means. Um, okay, um, uh, but I won't because math is not my favorite <laughs> subject. Um, so when you're thinking about that, how are the hotel, how is the whole, what is their latest ploy to try to stop you? I remember we were on the stage right. and uh, getting back to orgies. Uh, you said, I said, do you feel like they're the ones attacking you on these issues? And the orgies? The, the, no, you said there's been orgies going on yeah. in hotels for, for decades yeah. now. Yeah, um, but, but how do you feel the, that, um, that fight is going between you? Or have they changed, changed up their tactics or what? Yeah, I mean, like, I think, um, I think that it's changed quite a bit. There's an old saying, like, you know, uh, you know, first they ignore you, then they fight you, or laugh at you, then they fight you. I think we're hopefully, I don't know if we're winning, but we're certainly, I think, beyond the fighting. I'm actually close to the CEOs of most hotel groups, including of Marriott, Starwood, and uh, Hilton. And I think, you know, the thing they've realized is I think they were initially really scared. But hotel occupancy rates are the highest they've been in 20 years. Mm -hmm. And we are a pretty different kind of category. So there are local hotels around the world that have pretty big concerns. But you know, most of the big hotel chains they don't have major concerns with us. And they've said this publicly. I don't know of a major hotel CEO, like a global one, who said they've had a major problem with Airbnb. So who has that? Who, is it the small hotels? Is Some of the small hotels in New York um, in particular and a couple small cities around the world, they definitely have concerns do and you, questions. Do you think you'll ever own hotels or rooms or things like well, that? Well, you know, the promise we have is they're unique space spaces, one of a kind, offered by real people. And so I think that hotels probably wouldn't fit into that requirement. Would but you, if it's bespoke would, and unique, then we would love to have that on our Would you ever want to own like a hotel tonight kind of thing or, or that kind of, do you think you should offer those services? Um, well, I think, again, I think really, we have this very simple premise. People love homes. That's why they live in them. What if you live in one when you travel? I think we are really focused on staying in that core part of our so business. So you're going to just stay in that business? You don't yeah. see, where do you see any expansion for you besides internationally? So beyond international, and Asia is the biggest, fastest growing market for us. We're leading in China, India, Korea, and Japan. Pretty unique for an internet company. Business travel is growing really fast. Um, only about 10% of our business is business travel, but like, you know, we, are, uh, we have 150 companies that have signed up for us. Vacation rental is going to be a huge bet for us. And beyond that, you know, I really believe that we are, you ask people like, what kind of company are you? I would say, you know, we're in the technology industry, but what our, what our customers are buying is in technology, they're buying hospitality. We are a hospitality company, and I think hospitality shouldn't be limited to sharing your home. I think it should be, it could be really broadened out to a lot of different services. So, Such as? I don't know, you can imagine going but, on a vacation. You know, I was just thinking muffin baskets. You muffin baskets me, would be whatever. an amazing yeah, peer to peer muffin baskets. What, um, what could you imagine doing? Well, I mean, we've done a lot of experiments. We don't have anything to announce now, but I mean, the biggest asset somebody has, a lot of, yeah, a lot of people you ask, like, what's the biggest asset you have? Most people say the house. Airbnb have already done that. Actually, the biggest asset somebody has is their time. And just for example, we have 100,000 members in the city of San Francisco. Only 5,000 of them are hosts. There are 95,000 people that might have something else to share. And we're really looking at a lot of different options. But I think yeah. we're going to be focusing on the travel industry. So um, give me an example. You're saying. Well, I probably words. don't want to share an example, well, but there's. The, it's conceptual. Endless. Where's the area? Conceptual. Imagine. Cleaning yeah, services. yeah. So imagine you were to get off a plane in Paris. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, imagine people don't go to, home, to, to cities to stay in homes, they go to cities to have trips and experiences. Well, what are all the different types of experiences you would want to have 
when you're in a city. What are all the Paris? different types of services you would want in Paris? A French person yelling at me. Obviously. There you go. So imagine you had that on demand. Okay. <laughs> it happens on demand. Exactly. It does. I don't even have to ask. Well, now actually. you can just press a button and. Right. Okay. Um, I don't know wine or cafe that kind there of. There you go. All those things are possibilities for us. I mean, we, we're mostly looking at these opportunities. We haven't committed, but we're definitely looking at a lot of different. It feels a little group on y kind of thing, doesn't no, it? No, I mean, I think we're really focused on ordinary people sharing what they have in their life that other people would want access to. Tours, things like that. Yeah, all sorts of things. What like about that. cleaning and insurance? Well, we actually partner with Handy, and I think that they do that really, really well. And we've done some pilots with them in a few cities. So, so let's talk about your business as a business. Yeah. Are you profitable? Um, we don't disclose financials, but the business is going really well. Let me put it this way. We don't need to raise more money. Okay. Are you raising more money? <laughs> Probably won't make any comment on that either, but uh, um, yeah. <laughs> so I don't think you're profitable and you are raising money. That's what I'm getting from that answer. <laughs> um, so um, your last fundraising was at? It was at $13 billion, uh, end of, uh, 13 towards billion. the end of, uh, end of last year. What's Marriott valued at? Do you know? I don't know off the top. It's uh, probably double that. Okay. You're half of Marriott. Well, we were. Are you worth that? Well, we were half a million. We're, we're. Oh, okay, then. I mean, he is raising money, people. I'm not saying we're raising money, but the business is probably twice as big. Twice as big. Probably. Okay, so, so, we're, so your next valuation could go 25 billion, 30 billion. Well, I would presume we're raising money. Okay, all right. <laughs> you are. Okay. <laughs> we should talk about it. Okay, that's okay all right, exactly. Yeah, you're not going to say anything, but I'll find out. Um, so <laughs> the question is do I care? Um, uh, <laughs> anymore. It's up to you. Um, I do, deeply. I know. Um, it keeps me That's why you asked like four it, questions. Yes, exactly, because I want to understand, why are you worth that much money? Worth how much? I don't know, 25 billion. <laughs> 25 billion. Well, I don't, I don't know. I'm not, it's not, first of all, it's not 13 billion. Why are you worth 13 billion? That's even got my jaw. Down. I think that would be a better question for the investors to ask, but here's what I would say. Okay. Tourism's a two and a half trillion dollar market. Mm -hmm. It's five times the size of the advertising industry. We have 1.2 million homes around the world. Pretty soon we'll have a million and a half homes around the world. We are already the largest provider of accommodations on the planet in a huge industry, and it's growing really, really quickly, and our fastest growing market is Asia. I think the big thing that's happening is that Airbnb is in fact starting to go mainstream. For example, last year, the World Cup was in Brazil. 600,000 people went to the World Cup. One in five of those people, 120,000, stayed in Airbnb. We are now the official housing provider for the 2016 Olympics. You're going to see athletes staying in homes. So eventually this will create a business that is profitable. In, in of course. Revenues. Of course. It's doing really, really well. What are your revenues? It's really, they're really good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they're great. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, all right. I see where we're going here. Um, yeah. So, um, but, but that's the goal is to get to profitability. I think the goal of a business is to make money for sure. Right. And you, but right now it's sort of a land grab or a house grab. It's definitely a uh, land house grab. That's a really good description. Actually, right. I haven't heard that. Um, and you, um, you're expanding to Cuba? We expanded to Cuba. Um, you know, uh, President Obama lifted travel restrictions to Cuba in the beginning of the year. I immediately said to our team, like, we should, if there was ever a company that should be in Cuba, it would be Airbnb. It's you very. You really said that? If there's uh, ever a company that I should be in Cuba. I actually said that. I said okay. that. Because, and the reason why is there are these things called Casa Particulares, mm -hmm. which are basically people sharing their homes. They already do it, mm -hmm. but they have limited distribution because mm -hmm. they don't have a lot of, there's a 5% internet penetration in Cuba. We said, what if we can actually put those homes on our platform? By the time we launched, we had 1,000 homes. 40 days later, we now have 2,000 homes in Cuba. To put that into perspective, it took us three years to get 1,000 homes in New York. Mm -hmm. so, so North, it's growing really North quick. Korea next? What? Um, probably Iran next. Okay, all right, really? <laughs> well, if we were allowed to, I'd really right. focus on Iran. Where would you like to put them? Oh, I, Iran, um, North Korea would be a tough place to go. Right. Yeah, um, I think so. Um, you know, <laughs> I, uh, I, I don't know about the hospitality. Um, Antarctica. Yeah. The North Pole we're right. working on, okay. All right. and then we'll kind of move off of Earth from there, maybe. Okay, good. So you work with <laughs> Elon Musk closely. It, you know, I mean, like, somebody should provide the, like, the hardware, and someone should provide the hospitality. I think it would be a marriage made in heaven. All right, okay, all right, good. So, um, so IPO, is that what your goal is? Definitely not our goal. No, our goal is to obviously achieve our mission, um, but, you know, we are going to stay independent. That's the probably eventual outcome of an independent company. We don't have any plans. You know, I, I, I said, like, the moment we start working on IPO, that's like a two-year project to do, to do it well, probably. I'm not going to, I haven't started working on that, so it's not something we're focused on. And would you imagine ever getting acquired, although you're too Absolutely not. No way. No way. Why no is way. that? Because the companies that I admire, 
they are independent companies and their primary mission is their own mission, not the mission of their parent company. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's incredibly important for us to stay independent, to think long term. We, Joni and I, my founders and I, we've always wanted to build a company that could outlist, outlive ourselves. And that's made, meant, meant making really hard decisions, going a little slower at times, really, really building for the long term. Everything we built would be undermined by being a subsidiary of somebody else, at least for the kind of business we want to be in. And as I said, we're actually probably already one of the biggest hospitality companies in the world. So it just would not make sense for our type of business. Are you, having not prepared for an IPO, or would you be nervous to do that? Do you think you're the right person to be CEO? I think that if you asked my team, they would say that they have, a, you know, that we have a really, really great team. I think that um, we, if we, you know, what I would say is this: I would want to make sure, if we were ever a public company, that we've already set ourselves down a path to be bulletproof in the long term. The one thing about being a public company is you have a lot of short-term pressures. Yeah. I've been able to choose every investor I've had up until today. That would change. Mm -hmm. And those people today, I decide they should be really long-term investors. There's a lot of new things you're going to see come out for Airbnb mm -hmm. that I think will set us down the long term. I want to make sure that we do those things before we're a public company. As far as am I the right give person? Me a, well, give me an example of that. Well, like designing the end-to-end -end experience of a trip like we talked about, right. on-demand, somebody to right. do whatever in Paris. By the way, would that include flights? Would you see yourself doing that? I think that um, we were definitely not, you know, looking at flights right now. No, that's okay. a that's a pretty hard business to be in. Okay, but it's more the experience. I think we're really like, I think that Airbnb is about much more than homes and accommodations. It's really fundamentally about having a transformational experience in its best possible. Well, who do you way. consider a competitor then? Um, it's hard to say. I think um, you know so much of our travel, like. Give you one example. The beyond vacation, the number two use case in Airbnb is staying with friends and family. 40% mm -hmm. of all travel in the United States is with friends and family. We more of our business is probably taking away from people staying with their friends and family than the hotels. Mm -hmm. So I think it's primarily Which is probably a, a good thing. thing. Probably Honestly, a good thing. Yeah, yes, I think so. Exactly. Yeah. But I think the key is I think we're more of a category creator mm -hmm. than competing in an existing category. And getting back to the last question about you being a CEO. Um, What's it like in this sort of, do you think there's a bubble going on? Evan thought there was, and uh, you're one of these, you know, Snapchat, right, you, right. Uber, there's a whole bunch of them that are eventually heading to IPO right. or sale or something. Um, how is it operating in that environment? What's the worst part of it? Well, first of all, I don't think, you know, I think that's overstated to say we're in a bubble. Markets go up, markets go down. It's very clear that we're in an up market and it will eventually go down. That being said, you know, you think about the last bubble, there were what, how many people on the internet? Today you have three billion people almost on the internet. And you have companies that in five years could be capturing huge portions of industries that could be generating profits for many, many years to come. And a lot of these companies, we all have real revenues. So I think it's an overstatement to go that far. I do think this is a really, really exciting time to be like, alive and in, in running a company. If I was alive like in a different era, I would definitely not have these opportunities. And I think my general thought is when you have billions of people on the internet, I think it's day one. I think that we are going to be looking five years from now back and saying, wow, it's crazy. We thought that was the top of people. What are you worried about? I'm sorry to be a bummer. Yeah. I think I worry about, you know, Paul Graham, I used to, he was our first investor. And I used to worry about all these random things like competitors, uh, you know, kind of cities, all the stuff. And he said something to me I'll never forget. He said, Brian, startups die of suicide not homicide. Mm -hmm. All great companies that had a downfall, they died of self-inflicted wounds. Mm -hmm. So what are those self-inflicted wounds? That's a horrible thing to say. I know. But anyway. Um, but it's really, the key thing is, is about like, there's this thing that like, you're a small company and you exist because no one else, especially big companies, couldn't do what you could do as a small, nimble company. You know, Pablo Casso is saying, the older you get, the stronger the wind gets. It's always in your face. It's like <laughs> small companies become big companies and sometimes they become really bureaucratic. And the culture gets lost, people leave the company, that is something that's not unique to Airbnb, but that's a thing that we have to worry about, and I'm deeply paranoid about that. I want to make sure that we're always a startup, maybe the world's biggest startup, but so you, we stay so there. So you're scared of yourself. You have to be afraid of what you might become if you're not, like, you know, if you relax, that's for sure. Okay, questions for Brian? Ah, uh, Stuart. Okay. Hello. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Thank you, Kara. Hi, Brian. Hey, how are you? Um, I'm interested in, I, I'm fascinated by surge pricing done by Uber, and as a customer, it kind of pisses me off when they do that. I wonder if you've thought about surge pricing, and then I thought, well, you probably haven't because, you know, you don't have the same kind of constraint on supply, uh, and you don't really have a head-to-head -head comparison on any particular property. 
But have you thought about surge pricing? And what do you think of Uber doing surge pricing? Well, we have a pretty different model than um, Uber. Our hosts decide to list their place. They pick the price. Um, and we give pricing recommendations. There's a whole ecosystem of companies that can plug in, that can provide, um, that can provide price recommendations. So there are um, dynamic and elastic prices on our site. I think that we believe that people should be able to price what they want, and I don't think there's anything wrong with a certain price. I think it's key to be transparent and have choice. I really prefer not to comment on like another company's pricing strategy, but I do understand where they're coming from. Um, you know, that being said, we also are very, very clear with our community to not gouge tra travelers. So for example, we had a conference, uh, the Berkshire Hathaway Conference, where Warren Buffett you know, has his annual conference. We had close to 1,000 homes. Hosts had the opportunity to charge thousands of dollars a night. That would have defeated the whole purpose of democratizing the event. So we really did encourage people. We didn't tell them what to price, but we said, you know, be, try to be accessible. Don't, like, you sh a family shouldn't be spending like, their annual savings to stay in your home just so you can make some extra money. Hey, Brian, Mark hey. Haney. When you uh, think about problems that users and uh, hosts have had, uh, can you take off a couple of examples of problems that you've been able to imp improve on or address? Like, what have, been, what have you been able to do to bring down churn? How much of it's natural? How much of it's unnatural and fixable? Thanks. Um, early, you know, every step of the way, we've always learned about things. Early on, we found, and this was, you know, 2009, that photos were a really big deal, sight on scene. I'm going to go to another part of the world and I'm going to trust that when I get there, it's going to be a good experience. Because when I get there, if it's not, that's a real problem. So photos became a window into the world, a way to virtually experience someplace. Well, not everyone takes great photos. So one of the things we did is we said, what if there's a way you could press a button and a photographer can come to your home? And in 2009, we did that. Um, Joe and I were the first photographers. We literally like, would go door to door photographing people's homes. But now we have about 3,000 photographers on demand who photograph people's homes. That's just one example. Um, the other example would be Instant Book. So today, you know, as far as improving conversion rate, the way the core product worked was you, you go to book it, and there's a 24 hour window for the host to accept your reservation. Well, obviously, 2009, that seemed like a really, really cool idea. It was a lot easier than waiting days. 2015, suddenly people have an expectation to go much faster. And so now we have a product called Instant Book, which is basically you can book a home like a hotel, and about 25% of our homes are Instant Book. So that's probably one of the biggest things we're doing for conversion rate right now. Last question? Oh, two questions. Okay, go ahead. Bruno Baird and uh, Data Collective. Um, hey. So I'm staying in the third Airbnb rental uh, this month, actually, at the conference. And um, I like the Instant Book a lot, but it's not I've found, in my experience, very widespread. The second thing I would love is being able to actually unlock the home from a smartphone rather than waiting for someone to turn up with a key. Mm. And is there a path for both of those to become more widespread? Yes, that's for sure. Um, instant Book, um, as I said, it's 25% of our bookings right now are Instant Book. Um, I think I do imagine a day where the vast majority of our business will be Instant Book. Probably not all of it. Not everyone wants to do that. I think you're going to actually see that transition over the next 12 months. So I think by next summer, you're going to see you know, maybe a majority or close to a majority of the homes being Instant Book. As far as keyless entry, um, you know, we, um, we've got, you know, there's some really great companies that are doing some really cool stuff. And I really would be interested in you know, um, promoting some of those companies. Um, we're kind of still you know, working with the technology and deciding what we want to do with that right now. It's still problematic. John, last question. Uh, thanks. I, I know you said, Brian, that your international growth is particularly strong. I'm wondering if there is a percentage of your hosts who are particularly productive, and if there are characteristics of those that are different from occasional hosts that you can talk about. Um, probably the most productive people are, well, actually, it's pretty hard to kind of generalize. I would say that um, the most productive hosts are people who have never done this before. That was something that surprised me. I thought like pros coming on a platform being the most productive. It's usually people that are, you know, never done this before. Um, you know, the 55% of our hosts are women. Um, so um, people who come from the design or hospitality kind of interest are incredibly productive. And people who live in this like city. So example, in the city of Paris, we now have 50,000 homes. Almost everyone in Paris, you know, is like incredibly, incredibly productive. So it's also pretty market specific. I'm sorry, you said that diversity. I have to yes, ask you. Yes. Yes. What's your statistics? How do you feel about it? Yeah. Well, I think it's um, 
I think like a lot of the questions were asked, like, is tech fairly or unfairly targeted? I think it's probably fair because many people see tech as the change they want to see in the world. And so when we're not that change yet, people are let down. I think that we've done a really good job, but we have a long way to go. Um, we've released our studies, uh, our data. 47% of our employees are women, for example. 40% of our managers are uh, women. Um, but it's definitely not far enough. Um, we what are. your board? I'm sorry? Your board? So the board is just the founders and two venture capitalists. Um, we haven't added That's independent. That's a party. Yeah, party. exactly. But, um, um, but we haven't added independent members. But we, when we do, we will definitely add women. Is that, to that a priority board. for you? Do you think yeah, it should definitely. be? Do you think it should? It definitely should be a priority. I mean, being a public company or being a private company, focusing on I think executive team and having our leaders uh, being diverse is probably the biggest priority for us. That's where I spend most of my time. My most senior executive, actually, she's in the audience, Belinda Johnson. She's a woman. So um, we have, you know, we really do focus on this issue. We also have. Um, to uh, two members of uh, the gay members on our executive team. Um, and so we have a pretty, um, we have a group called Glam inside of the Airbnb, which is really, really active uh, part of the LGBT community. So it's really, I think, an incredibly important part of our business. Is it important to you? Do you think it matters? Do you think it matters at all? Or is it just, you know, I had Ben Horowitz, yeah. he's like, I'm not going to pick based right. on anything. But I think that it's uniquely important to Airbnb, probably more than most companies. And the reason why is, again, when you have nearly a million people a night living together, you need to have an inclusive culture. And you need to have people from all walks of life being part of your community. The majority of our community, 55% are women. They're from 191 countries around the world. And we need to be the inside the company what our promise is outside the company. I think that our community outside the company is even more diverse than our company inside the company. So we need to better match that. I think it's imperative for the survival of our, of our business to, to, to be what we want to become in the world. Okay, I'm going to hold you to that. Thank yeah. you, Brian. Thank Chester. you very much. Take care.